idol is trying to find a solution other than God. So what am I doing in my own strength to fix my depression, to fix my, I mean, you, you insert problem, mm -hmm. and am I trying to solely go at a problem on my own, or do I at least include God in it? Hi, and welcome to the Anything But Quiet Time podcast. We are Rochelle and Carter. This is where we kind of discuss our quiet time. Yeah. And in 2024... Yeah maybe getting back to the basics, to the beginning, but you're yeah. wait, actually, you're kind of smack dab in the middle of the Old Testament. Well, it does have to do with diet and exercise. Um, oh. And so uh, it is, I honestly, I finished Jeremiah in 2023, yeah. but this is stuck with me. I'm like, this is totally the beginning of the year type of attitude. Speaking of diet and exercise, I had such lofty plans. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have this program, an app on my phone that gives you, all right, this is what you're going to do the next several days. And then I got sick. And you're way behind. I think you just feel really bad. And you just, if you feel like that, don't feel like that. So my wife was inspiration. She's she bought the Bible recap from Tara Lee Cobble. Yeah. And she's she's been on with us before. And um I don't know what even happened, but she didn't get started until like the 20th. Yeah. And but but Life she started. Yeah. She, she started, started those. I was proud of her. And honestly, anything worth doing is worth doing well, is not actually what I was going to say, but anything worth doing, I think we have it in our mind it has to look a certain way sure. or be a certain way. And then yeah. The enemy can use that if, I, if I'm not careful yeah. to keep me from doing the thing that I knew to do. Well, I didn't do it. Yeah, that's so true. So it's over. Yeah. Might well, as well give up. I think that really is great thinking about diet and exercise because what when it comes to the the fad diets, the mm -hmm. thing of this, this is what will work. It's the thing that doctors don't know about. Those, those types of things, <laughs> right? When doctors yeah. constantly just say diet and exercise. Yeah diet and exercise. It, it it stands the test of time. And yet for some reason, oh, once I took the glue codes out of my food, then, then I was able to drop 50 pounds in two days. Yeah. <laughs> like those kinds of things that come up. So I've heard it over and over again as well. It, take it easy on yourself. Be patient. Yeah. yeah. Because if you do everything super gung ho, you could, you could hurt yourself actually. Sure. Sure. And then that would keep you from long term. But also just, I mean, with anything, if you take the baby step approach, which just, let's be honest, is mind-numbingly irritating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to take that approach. And yet there's growth in that approach. There's, I mean, let patience have its perfect work is what the New Testament reminds us. Uh, and it'll build character. I don't want to build yeah. character. I want to build muscle. Uh, well, it, wait. It's the old-fashioned, long approach that we don't want. But it's the, that's the one that sticks. And here is the people in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, mm -hmm. that's given some bad news constantly in the book of Jeremiah, yeah. uh, the people that have abandoned God, that surefire yet, because when we read it, we think it's so simple, yet decades and centuries go by as God slowly moves at times. Mm -hmm. And I think we see it all in three chapters and they see it generations, mm. right? So it, it goes slow in certain aspects of, yeah. first of all, getting to the promised land way back in the beginning of the Bible. And it's Jeremiah 44, near the end of Jeremiah, that I, it was such an interesting passage that I'm like, th this is exactly that approach. We don't want that old fashioned answer. And it's yet when we seek God, that's always been and not something new and flashy when we see God at work. So this is what Jeremiah 44, 15 says. Uh, it, actually, 14 and verse 17. Then all of the women present and all of the men that knew their wives had burned incense to idols. Mm. A great crowd of all the Judeans living in northern Egypt and southern Egypt answered Jeremiah, we will do whatever we want. We will burn incense and pour out liquid offerings to the queen of heaven, an idol, just as much as we like, just as we and our ancestors and our kings and officials have always done in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For in those days, we had plenty to eat and we were well off and had no troubles. Mm -hmm. So this has been, I mean, they're, they're getting exiled for a reason because they have done exactly what Jeremiah is saying. This is why you're getting exiled. And yet they look back generations mm -hmm. and they go, we've we been doing this for years. Didn't get in trouble before. It's fine. Yeah. They figured it out after this so-called God led us here. We figured out our own way and we're doing just fine. And 
it can seem like God is not active because he's so patient. Mm. And so that's, I mean, that's just inspiration yeah. for us, right? That when I try to go my own way, when I try to, somebody, somebody painted a picture recently of what an idol is. And I don't, I don't think it's not what we commonly say. We ought, we commonly say, well, those were their idols. What's ours? What do you like too much? Mm-hmm. And then I have to go, I watch too much football. And then, and then I, uh, I'll try to stop watching less football. And that it tends to just kind of go there, which I mean, I think there's truth to that. But more so, they, and I'd never heard it put like this, but it was a Sunday school teacher of mine that said, an idol is trying to find a solution other than God. Mm -hmm. So what am I doing in my own strength to fix my depression, to fix my, I mean, you you insert problem, Mm -hmm. and am I, of course, I'm not saying anything about uh, eating healthy or therapy or anything like that. I'm just saying, Am I trying to solely go at a problem on my own or do I at least include God in it? Mm-hmm. And that I see synonymous with what they were doing at the time. They're going to, this God isn't really who he says he is or isn't fixing this fast enough. I'll go my own way about yeah. it. And they weren't patient in that way. No. We mistake patience for weakness. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very that's true interpersonally, right? I think that's very true. And especially with God when he is waiting and giving them chance after chance. I mean, you think about Jeremiah had a really difficult task of being the the bad news bearer. Right. Bearer a lot guy, of those guys did, right? You know, yeah. and Isaiah and mm-hmm. and uh, the students of Isaiah uh you kind of think back all right, was there a prophet actually that had good news to share? You'll see highlights of it in those books. Um, and the yet, I think right. Moses actually was, I mean, he got a, a pretty good job, but you know, it didn't even matter if you bring good news mm-hmm. to the people. They didn't want that either. Right, that's true. Yeah. You know, you're darned if you do, darned if you don't sometimes right. with, with humanity. And so seeing how fickle we are and remembering that aspects of, of our, our character now looking to the character of God and his patience with our character. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not, mm-hmm. don't mistake yeah. that for weakness. Right. He's giving a sample opportunity to change. Yes. And and this was uh, so beautifully painted at church the other day, we're starting to go through Genesis. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's exactly what I had just gone through in Jeremiah. Yeah. Where the, the enemy says, the serpent says to the woman, uh, you won't die if you eat the fruit. And then they try the fruit, Adam and Eve try the yeah. fruit, and, and they don't. They don't die. It seems like maybe there's not a problem at all. And it was put this way. They thought, oh, this must be fine mm-hmm. because they didn't have immediate ramifications. And our pastor brought up the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And it was this new way, get out of that fuddy-dud lifestyle of the 40s and 50s that we've seen our parents do, and this is truly the way, and it's free, and it's peace, and it's, and for maybe 10 years, I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's horror stories within even Woodstock alone, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, But for a while, it seemed like, oh, cool, people can just be sexually liberal in this way, and it's just fine. And yet- there was a there was a study. There's a book on it uh, mm-hmm. in the early or mid two thousands um, that were was talking about as decades pass by, we see these ramifications. Generations have now been affected, and whether that might be uh, illness due to that, whether that might be broken relationships, whether that might be um, a, a lack of empowering women in this mm-hmm. way, uh, there's so many ramifications that have, in 50, 60 years, reared its it's reared its head, and just like Jeremiah, just like Adam and Eve, you may not see it instantly. And yet God's way was the true way the whole time. And you know, what's interesting about the serpent is that he did not say full, like he wasn't full on deception. It was half truths for most of it, wasn't he, it? Half baked truth. Yeah. And he would twist it for his own purpose to try to tempt. And it was a temptation because I could be like God. Right. Which right. essentially uh, idolatry is really about, I want to put myself on the pedestal because I know best anyway. Mm-hmm. And it may be a little golden statue, but I mean, let's face facts. 
we created it. Right. So we yeah. have everything to do with it. Yeah. And we're the ones who set its parameters and what it does. And this is the God over the sun. And this is, I guess some could say, could we at least affirm that they're recognizing that this was something apart from themselves that they created? I guess you could, but I think it really all does come back down to, but they created it. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who set the terms, not God. Yeah. Yeah, and, about and what that God can do or can't do, or the it, little little G God. And in terms of serving that that made up yeah. idol, it's very convenient. There's nothing, uh, for the most part, I will say, that is self sacrificial. There's no denying um, uh, emotions. There's no denying temptations and desires. Yeah, most of the time with idols. Certainly for people in powerful positions. Right. Yes, that's true. Because yeah. if you were a slave, and well, right. Ra wants you to do this. Right. Thing. But Ra, it's the people uh, who made the god. Exactly. That, yeah. No, that's a very good point. But you know, the enemy twisting that truth. There is a part of the '60s that I think was wanting to disclose the hypocrisy of the generations before who may have been very sexually active. Right. But that's it's behind true. closed doors. Yeah, that's true. And so that's hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. We should just, you know what? Forget all of that stuff. Work, And then there's like that, we've talked about this before in, in our podcast, the pendulum swing instead of finding a balanced place. Yeah. Now it's this extreme. Now everybody's going to do it. Mm -hmm. There aren't any more closed doors. And no, that's that's where the enemy always wants us to do. Just these extreme yeah. Taking what might be true, twisting it, and then deceiving. Yeah, uh, and then we're buying into it, of course, because it, it, it's it's, it's temporal, re and it's refreshing because it's the opposite. Yeah, that all you've dealt with them for the last ten or twenty years. And so we have to yeah. be very careful because he does that in our faith too. Yeah, in our faith culture, and um, we may see very obvious sin that we clearly read in the Bible is like that is not okay. But then there's like the stuff that the enemy can take and twist that. Uh, it may be even a good thing, but it's not a good timing for that good thing in your life. And God has said no. And the enemy will come along and say, but yes. Mm. I, I actually talked about that with Caleb, um, my my youngest son. We were talking about creation because actually, you know, starting to read God uh, God's word again, starting out in Genesis again, and talking about creation and the story of creation. God created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I really don't think it was in order to keep... He, it wasn't like he was keeping that from Adam and Eve. I think there was a desire at one point maybe in the relationship that was designed to, at the after the process of time had, had passed, allow them to eat from the tree. But you're just... You just got born. <laughs> you just got birthed, and you are allowed to eat of any of these other trees, this is all good. This tree, it's too much, too soon. It's like anything else when you're you're keeping your children from certain activities. You're not going to give your three year old the keys to the car, you know. But that doesn't right. mean that one day you won't yeah. give the keys to the car. So I now I have no. It's a theory. I mean, it's a. Th I mean, no sure. basis yeah. to think that that's a thing. Right. Why? I, you, so you're saying he didn't just put that as a test? I think because we were made in the image of God, and this is my hypothesis, my my belief anyway, and I'm holding it like this loosely, not gripping it, white knuckles. As most of Genesis should be done. <laughs> Just, you know, this is a narrative, right? Yeah. But, uh, and a narrative that uh, it traditionally was passed to Moses in in the first five books of, of uh, the Tanakh or the Old Testament, as we call it. And we're still not sure, we know there's some, but how allegorical is it too, for all right. of it, right? So anyway. Right, so, but... When I think about the knowledge of the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God made us in his image. He wanted to bestow on us the opportunity to speak into creation. I mean, yeah. you observe that even with the very first thing that he gives to Adam. Everything else has been created. We're the last thing he created. We're special. He breathes his life into us, and he has spoken into being all these things around us. And now he has e equipped man to be able to speak and give a name. Right to yeah. the things around him. That's right. So we're starting to see, oh, these things are kind of characteristic. You know, we're like mini him, we're like mini me's, uh -huh. you know? And he wants us to have these things that are good. But the knowledge of what is good and evil, that is a very big 
that's a big undertaking and mm-hmm. it's not for you right now. So that is just a thought. So, but the enemy comes along and says, you will be like God. In a sense, now we have this knowledge of right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In a sense, we do know exactly what God, I mean, he even so much as says, you know, he's having a conversation with he himself and I, mm-hmm. you know, the Trinity and saying, um, we're not going to let them go to that place because it's going to, it's going to run rampant. It's going to go to a place that there's no return, point Mm. of no return. And I have created these things and I've called them good for a reason. Yeah. Right. So anyway, were you done with Genesis? Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and that's uh, interesting. I'd be curious what you have to say, because we got, we've dug into Genesis, obviously at church. Yeah. uh, And then Kelsey, when she did their Bible recap, my my wife uh, was, was talking about those first and then Sunday school, my gosh, it was just been a lot, obviously beginning of the year uh, of, of, you know, the order of things and the different views of young oh, earth yes. creation and old earth creation and all of that. So there, and that's another big one to hold loosely. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Holding it loosely and not looking our nose down at, at somebody who may not be there yet in conversation. Mm-hmm. So they've read it and they know that this is the inerrant word of God. And that means that this is exactly this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not ever going to try to take that away from people. It, um, but I also know that symbolically we've come to understand nuances of the Old Testament it, it, that that have great meaning. The numbers may have not been specifically. Yeah, there's a know, lot of symbolism at this stage of exactly. of, of the text, right? It's it's um, almost to the point where if I if my son the other day made this giant exaggeration, he's like, "Oh, I said that like a zillion times," you know, uh-huh. and it's like. Yeah. Clearly, you didn't say it a zillion times. And I think what we don't gather of the Bible, we take it literally. And um, I think, uh, how did Terry Lee Cobble say it? Uh, and there's been so many great thoughts at church in that. Of the Bible is literally true, but not always literal. <laughs> like that kind of thing. Like it, yeah. what your son said, yes. we don't think like this with like old ancient people, right, but right. what your son said is allowed and and people did that in in so many ways. Maybe not with that tone, a right. jillion. But but now. that's allowed to in ancient times write it like that. Mm-hmm. That it, the, people at the time would have known. Oh, this is just meant to be considered like a long season, maybe not a literal day, like yeah. things like that. Have you ever run into like happy accidents? Uh, well, what do you mean? Like with just your life, like you find things that connect. We were recently talking with uh, Pastor Greg Mott, mm-hmm. and he was talking about, I worked at Randall's. I was a checker at Randall's, and the the lady who was the checker there, it was before he got married, super cute. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we're going to have a conversation. I always wanted to stay in that lane because she was super cute, but she was also a believer. <laughs> uh-huh. And she started pouring into him and talking to him about Jesus. She goes to, uh, potentially, it was a KSBJ concert event. She comes back riding the high of that Michael W. Smith and friends are friends forever song. Uh And she's calling him and talking to him about it and invites him to, to go to church because she didn't have all the answers to the questions he was asking. He goes to church uh, at his, I guess it was the youth pastor's house or something like that, Uh gets saved that night in that living room, remembers the exact date, the moment, everything. And what was fascinating about that, he said, she went to a concert at Second Baptist Church. It was a concert more than likely with – it was a KSBJ artist, perhaps a KSBJ event. All these things full circle. It's like these connections get made. And he said, and I am now talking to you as the pastor of First Baptist Church on KSBJ, which is the radio station you and I have a show mm-hmm. on. And he's just like, that's kind of – that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. It's like, maybe mm-hmm. it's a happy accident. Maybe it's not a coincidence at all. But, you know, Jesus, there were no happy accidents. There was no Bob Ross. It was a happy little bush. We'll just right. put it right there. You know, these <laughs> things were on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just the, your brain would explode, I think, to try to connect it all. I am grateful for the Marvel-like universe that gives us now these into the Spider-Verse type places where you see the levels potentially – of interdimensional this and that mm-hmm. because God does not exist in or on our timeline apart from when he was the person of Jesus Christ and is the person of Jesus Christ and yeah. was here right. for that span of time, right? And now he's with with, with Father God. But uh, it, it, that's kind of hard in and of itself to try to fathom. You can't. Sure. Really. Yeah. Um, and then to think or try to fathom what I'm about to share I, I don't know, that he knew at least at one point in my lifetime that I would stumble upon this. And if for nobody else, it blessed me. So 
on the third day of creation, everything that this planet would ever need to survive was created. Mm -hmm. We're talking all the vegetation, the grains, things like that. That's what, you know, at, at the animals would eat initially until the fall of man. And then we get it, you know, we start seeing animals sacrificed for, well, not just, you know, giving at the altar and asking for God's forgiveness, but to eat right. the clean yeah. animals that we were allowed to eat. Um, but those animals to survive, the trees to survive, everything that we would need for life was created on the third day. On the third day, our God also gave us everything we would need for the next life through mm. the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. I've also, uh, we've, heard, we've heard it said that on the third day of like addiction, if you're in rehab, that's the most difficult day to get off alcohol, drugs, sure, something like that, food, your third day of dieting. And I can testify to that, the hardest day. But even in thinking about that, what that would mean for you in 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 the depths that addiction can take you and you're trying desperately to struggle out, remembering that on the third day, God gave us everything we would need then and forever. Sure. At the beginning sure. of time and right smack dab in the middle, if you will, when Jesus came and died for us on the cross and rose again on the third day. I, I think uh, we've talked about some of these of like um, – I don't, I start to, especially with the internet and how, and even chain emails, you know, beforehand, right. you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the Bible has 365 promises. Oh yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. It's just, I don't buy a lot of the common man-made seemingly coincidences. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'm like, I, cause there's not, there's more, right. there's less or whatever. Right. But I, I think you do see symbolism yes. on something, intentional symbolism on something like a creation on the third day and Jesus on the third day. On the third day. I mean, I think you'll when you look back at the Old Testament, there are things that you go... I even stumbled across one the other day because Jeremiah was actually reading last mm -hmm. year. So I was started reading Hosea and it's somewhere in the 14th chapter, it said, because it, it, it's talking about bad stuff. Yeah. It, it's, like, it's like, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, you know, uh, right, right. And, and it's like, this is like, and I'm like, that's very similar that to- so much like- And sure enough- Absolutely. It's the symbolism that was used when Paul wrote Corinthians mm -hmm, to reference mm -hmm. that, but but he's saying now, uh, where is your sting? When where, you're reading, which is why we've talked about reading from beginning to end the book, yeah. you start to pick up all those nuances like you yeah. just said. That's right. Um, yeah. Psalm 22 is another one where you start going, oh my word. And then I can't remember if it's 24 or 34, but recently rereading the Psalms, uh, there's another one talking about no bones will be broken. And a mm -hmm. lot of the New Testament authors are like, do you remember that statement? Right. Yeah. Why would you say that? But, but we and have- And Jesus' bones weren't broken. We have ones that, you and I just referenced ones that mm -hmm. the apostles acknowledged, mm -hmm. but what you're acknowledging, I, I don't necessarily know if it ever was, but I, I, you see the symbolism in creation there. We've heard other the, uh, theologians talk about, you know, the comparison, and I think Jesus himself compared himself to Jonah, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. um, those comparisons, they're- Easy to find if you start reading through, right? And yeah. fascinating. Uh, something else that I picked up, um, you know, post Noah, post the flood, and by the way, again, everything that would be needed for life. I mean, just not, uh, let alone grain, oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From trees. I just hey, yeah. can, can I say one that will we'll blow yeah. your mind? Yeah, though? yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we were me, me and my wife were talking about this last night. Mm -hmm. Okay, depending on how you take. Genesis, and do you think the earth is 6,000 years old or millions of years old? And do you think it's more allegorical in terms of, you know, the story's right, there, right. but the timeline? Uh -huh, I know, yeah. Well, the vegetation was on day three. Mm -hmm. The sun wasn't made until day yeah. four or five. How did that work? So how does that even work? Yeah. Unless it's symbolic. But it does say there's a light, at, you know, God said, let there be light. Let it's there like there the first thing. Light. But that's referencing something else but also because we don't want to put God in a box, right? God could sustain vegetation without a sun if he wanted to. And we know that in Revelation, it talks about how there was no sun. It didn't need it because of the brightness of- That's right. Yeah, that's true. The new God. Jerusalem, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, that was, you know, that's power in the city now, baby. Sure, sure. But it's just interesting. Yeah. It is fascinating and, and it's exciting. And when you kind of share that with your kids, 
because you've invested in it and you can maybe even relate it to like I did with my son, the spider verse. And he's like, wow. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I never really thought not that, you know, that's going to like Thanos is coming in or anything <laughs> like that, but I'm just saying. Don't carry it away. Right. Yeah. But uh, there was also something else that I, I've noticed with these characters that for so, I can say characters, these were real people. Sure. Yeah. But for so long as a child, and I, I was in a blessed situation. I know you were too. We grew up with families that had us in church and you would hear the Sunday school version of these stories. Yeah. And I'll never forget the first time I read through Genesis because it was kind of a part of a program. I was a part of Wednesday night services. And I was like freaking out. Is this saying what I think it's saying about some of the, the carnage that I was reading yeah. and that's disgusting. You know, when it got to Lot's daughters and Oh, right. You know, these, um, these characters, I'm thinking about Abraham and I'm thinking about how his dad was the one who starts traveling the family and Abraham and what, what was it like? What, what kind of man was this guy? He decides he's going to take up his nephew, almost like a son. That speaks volumes about his character, right? His brother's dead. So this is now my son. Um, and takes care of Lot and even allows Lot to choose the nice land from the, you know, from the bad land. And Abraham ends up taking the, the drier land and Lot gets the lush land. So that kind of tells you about Lot right there too. <laughs> um, but you do wonder about, did they also have other gods in their mind? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, what, which ones would those have been? We do know that from, you know, the story of, of Rachel later on with Jacob, she takes the household idols, and that's a fun story to read and uh, lies to her dad. There's a lot of lying throughout these Bible characters. You just – you think of them as like, that's Rachel, and she was this, and she was a great person, and she may have been, but all you read is just this. And what you what you see is what is it the felt the felt uh, the, the, uh, yeah the flannel graph flannel graph <laughs> yeah that's it's they're great they're, they're the flannel great. graph characters they've done nothing wrong what do you think about okay so I, uh, this is the last thing I I'd love to talk about is Jacob now Jacob is just he's a cheater and is that kid probably that we all knew in school that got his way somehow and like. I don't know, he went to the school after hours, somehow broke in and got the grades and, and changed them or whatever. That was Jacob. I mean, because you think about what, what you must not have had great respect for God. Maybe he didn't even believe in his dad's God, mm -hmm. but he was superstitious because he wanted the blessing and he wanted the, the firstborn rights. So he tricked his brother into giving him his firstborn rights and I mean, how seriously did Esau take that? He must have been real hungry. Super hungry. Yeah. Give me some soup. Only if you pass over your birthrights. Okay, done. And then his I mean, what kind of relationship are we talking about here with Rebecca and Isaac? Rebecca's like, I've always liked you best. And yes, God actually did tell Rebecca, at least this is what we read in Genesis, that the younger of the two twins is going to be the leader. Yeah. So I don't know if she always held that in her heart or just what, but she always favored Jacob. And so she helps him with this giant trick and tricks her husband who's super old and blind. I mean, think about this. How messed up do you got to be to like, hey, let's pull one over on your blind old dad before he dies, you uh -huh. know? <laughs> and <laughs> Rob's, <laughs> Rob's, and Isaac like asked, uh, he over and over again is asking, are you Jacob? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't even fathom doing that to my dad. If he really knew the God of his dad and his grandfather, right? would he even dare? So we then see well, Jacob run and, away. And let me say you this. Talk, okay. This is what's interesting. As you're yeah. reading Hosea, this this caught my eye the other day. Obviously, he's talking about the nation of Israel uh -huh. uh, who came from, from Jacob. But but this is this is what uh, uh, he says. He's about to punish Jacob uh, and synonymous with Israel, the right. nation of Israel That's his name, for right. all his deceitful ways and pay him back for all he's done. But then he says, even in the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother, 
when he became a man, he even fought with God. Yeah. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and won. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. There at Bethel, he met God, he met God face to face and God spoke to him. Well, that's where I was going, was with Bethel. And uh-huh. Bethel is this place where he ends up asleep. And I, I, this is what I'm picturing. This is not what scripture says. This is what I'm picturing. He has this dream and we've called it Jacob's Ladder. And it's probably more like what you would see on the side of like a ziggurat temple or something like that. It's like a big steep staircase. And he sees angels on it, which honestly you can, speaking of symbolism, take that to where Jesus talks about it later. And you will see angels going up and down on the son of man. Mm. This is the pathway to heaven is what Jesus is saying. Mm. I am the pathway to heaven. But Jacob has this dream of this stairway and there's these angels going up and down and there's God at the top of it. And then it's like it hits him like a ton of bricks. Oh my gosh, this is real. Hmm. Like that's how I, that's how I read it. This is real. And then you'd be in freak out mode, right? Because you don't know the, uh, he assures him in the dream, but he doesn't say on his own merit. He's like, I am the God of Abraham. Okay. And I'm going to do for your family because of your grandpa and your dad. Mm-hmm. This is not because <laughs> you don't read anywhere, Jacob, because you've been a profound right. person yeah. in, in this world. In History fairness, so far. No, God never says that to anyone. Well, <laughs> on their right, own, on their very, own merit, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, he does honor people. He honors the friendship that he had with Moses. Mm-hmm. He he honors what he the covenant with Abraham. Sure. He, he even calls David a man with a whole heart for him, you know? So there are ways that God acknowledges, and Noah, sure, sure. you're a guy of merit. You are a guy that I am going to save. Mm-hmm. And Jacob, you got in by the skin of your teeth because of grandpa mm. and your dad, and I see you, and I've got you. But then, <laughs> so he wakes up from this dream. He's like, I can just imagine like crap. (laughs) And so he was sleeping on a pillow that was a rock and he puts this rock upside and he's like, he like sprinkles it with, with oil. This is where I saw God. This is Bethel. That's like the best he can do. That's all he knows to do. And I just, I thought it was interesting. I wrote, how bananas does that sound? God encounters Jacob in a dream, tells him that he will keep his promise to Jacob's relatives, right? And Jacob realizing that God is in fact real, he'll keep Jacob. And I also think it's interesting that um, that he decides then and there that that's when he's going to give him a tenth of everything he owns. And they don't think God asked for that. Mm. He just does it. Abraham had done that with Melchizedek. Perhaps that's something that... Um, the, which is the priest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you may remember this. There's this war and Abraham goes and he fights these guys off and he helps these kings and, and this high priest, who's also a king, comes out and his name is High Priest Melchizedek. For the, a very mysterious figure. Just if, yeah, a yeah. lot of people equate him to Jesus. In fact, in Hebrews, it talks about, you know, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, Abraham was like, I'm going to give him a tenth of what I have. And in the order of Melchizedek, you know, that's Jesus is in that order. And some have even theorized, and this is hugely theoretical, but it's like, oh, what if that was Jesus? Yeah, I've heard that. Because yeah. he's in and out. Yeah. You don't read about him ever again until like Hebrews. So I guess maybe that had stuck with the family. I don't know where Jacob got that, but he's like, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything I own. And it also made me think about, you know, God keeps us not because of what we can do for him, but because of who he is. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I come up with ideas that are super grand and I'm going to do all of this for you, God. And I'm going to, did sure. I even ask him? Did yeah. I even talk with him? Did God in that prayer or in that prayer, in that dream say, hey, this is what I'd like you to do? Mm. No, Jacob just did it. And it's a reminder, there is nothing that I can give him that he doesn't already own. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, it says in Psalms. He owns everything. He made everything. Yeah. But he does want obedience. And he is looking for those who are listening, not just acting, reacting, which yeah. I have a tendency to do that. Calm down. And there that word patience kind of comes in again. It's like, he's patient with me. Can I be patient enough in my day and my time to give to him and really be listening? What does God, what does he desire? Well, I think when you alluded to Abraham and were there other gods at the time, it was, I think it was a very mm-hmm. polytheistic world. Yeah. 
And I think what's fascinating is, because it's, it's obviously alluded to in Genesis, but also in Romans, the faith of Abraham. Mm-hmm. And just, just the way I process it with some data there, I guess, is we know Abraham, we know this, Abraham was counted righteous by faith alone. Mm-hmm. It wasn't because he did, it was because, he, I mean, this is a quote, he, because he believed God. Mm-hmm. And just with the way I'm kind of processing how the world was at the time and and this revelation of God, what it seems to me is there is not this, because of the fall, obviously Adam and Eve knew God, but because, because of the fall, there's a world there at Abraham's time where nobody really knows who the true God is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of idols. And Abraham hears this voice, and it must have been different from any other fake God that he's dealt with, right? Well, he heard a voice, which probably right there was a giant difference maker. A a major difference. Never heard voices from other gods before. And I know there's demonic activity, so maybe he did, but this is real, Mm -hmm. right? And he's just obedient to it. And... What I find fascinating is he probably doesn't know much because as time goes on and there's prophets and there's individuals, God reveals a little more of who he is each time. He doesn't even say to anybody what his name is Mm -hmm. until Moses. Right. Abraham goes this whole time without even knowing God's name. Mm-hmm. And so we have this theology that we can point to nowadays and go, this is the God that does this and his name is this and blah, blah, blah. Well, he didn't have that no. info at the time. He's no. just in faith responding to what he knows is true, this voice that has reached out. Yes. And I think that's a beautiful picture for us to, in faith, in obedience, yes. respond to what God is truly calling that's us to. That's really, really good. And and recognize that we are going to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, that yeah. these are faulty characters. I mean, if you think about it, really, Carter, it, we we mentioned this before. If C.S. Lewis, when he said that Jesus was what God wanted to say, mm-hmm. I can't imagine Jesus went a day without crying. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine because mm-hmm. I think in those thirty three years of his life on this planet, he knew the stories from the past. He. He saw them take place. Yeah. He knew that they would yeah. happen before they happened. He saw people like Hagar. Mm-hmm. She was a sex slave. Mm. This was Abraham's slave. The, the women that Rachel and Leah were their servants, and they, without a thought, here, have sex with her. Mm. They were slaves. Mm-hmm. This is not a flannel graph story. Right. Right. This is the ugly part of biblical history. Yeah. And these were the people that God was choosing to bless, not on their merit, yeah. but because of the character of God. That's and true. he saw some faithfulness in Abraham. And I think he nurtured that. And, he, and then when Moses comes along, he he went further in. You know, he's yeah. now I'm giving you my name. I'm also giving you my rules. And now, now you're waking up to you're never going to be able to live up to this. Right, right. And so yeah. I, that, thank God, Jesus came. But can you imagine his... 33 years of witnessing the things that he did, feeling the things that he did, knowing past history of what that must have been like. Sure. And weeping. Yeah. So good to yeah. think about. Yeah. Uh, this is the Anything But Quiet Time podcast. If you are new and you have made it this whole time, thank you for checking this out. Yeah. This has been a great conversation. And if you want to watch, you can text the word quiet to the number 893-893. If you're already watching on YouTube and you're like, oh, you know what? I'd like to listen to that on the way to somewhere. And you're thinking, wow, they matched today. You wore that jacket when I already had this one on. You made a choice. No, like I brought this jacket because this was my jacket. You intentionally put it on to, to I copy. I I intentionally put it on. I appreciate that, I, that you admitting that. You're a trendsetter and I wanted to be like you. It was like when you order something <laughs> at a restaurant and yeah. somebody copies your order. Ooh, that looks good. What did you order? The worst is, the worst <laughs> is when somebody asks, what are you going to get? And you tell them, but then they go first. So to the waiter, it looks like you copied them. Oh, I don't care that much. Oh, I've changed my order before. <laughs> All right, so again, if you're watching on YouTube and you'd rather listen, if you want to get that Spotify or Apple link, you can still text the word quiet to the number 893-893.